The member for Jaga Jaga. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, this bill really reflects so much of the Morrison government's approach to climate policy. It's very late. And while this government has been dithering and playing political games, coming up with slogans, Australia has been missing out on the potential offshore wind energy that offers us in contributing to our energy needs, in reducing our emissions and in creating jobs. So it's good that this bill is finally here, albeit late, but the regulatory framework for Australia's offshore wind industry has been so delayed that vital projects and jobs remind, my, remain mired. And Labor has long called for legislation to unlock the benefits of offshore renewables and particularly offshore wind generation because we know that we have enormous capacity here in Australia for offshore wind generation. As well as that generation capacity, offshore wind offers us thousands of jobs and billions in investment for regional communities, including and especially those who are most impacted by changes in global energy markets. So it is shameful that these benefits have been delayed by this government. Those opposite had promised that the legislative settings and framework for this would aim to be in place and operational by mid-2021. Instead, we are belatedly getting the introduction of these bills, and we know that for them to be implemented is most likely to take uh, well into next year. And Deputy Speaker, I said that this reflects so much of the slowness around this government's climate policy and its attitude towards tackling climate change. And I did hope, like so much of our country hoped, that this week would be different. We thought that this was the end of the more than a decade-long climate war, the end of eight years of inaction from this government, the end of slogan and spin, a result after all the bluster and noise that was coming out of the Nationals. Well, we were wrong. Let's be very clear about what we got out of the Prime Minister's big climate reveal yesterday. It was not a plan. It had no ambition. We got a pamphlet and we got some slides. Not a plan. No legislated target. None of the increased ambition we need to avoid catastrophic warming. I do admit there was one new part in yesterday's climate reveal. We did get some new slogans. And we do know that this is a Prime Minister who loves a good slogan. And in fact, that's all this Prime Minister thinks it takes. He has no interest in grabbing hold of the jobs and the industries and the potential of the future, of grabbing hold of the action that we need to take and making sure that our entire country benefits from it. He has no genuine commitment to net zero and the action we need to take to avoid catastrophic warming. And in fact, how can he have any sort of genuine uh, commitment? When you look around him, when you look at the, the balance he's trying to bring, the coalition he's trying to stitch together, his own deputy prime minister has said he doesn't believe in net zero. That's the deputy prime minister who is going to be in charge when the prime minister takes off for Glasgow tomorrow. And in fact, we've just heard in, in estimates questioning that this government has not had Treasury do any modelling on the economic costs or benefits of net zero by 2050, or indeed any modelling of climate change related impacts on the Australian economy. None at all. Now that says everything you need to know about the Prime Minister's commitment, about his government's commitment to genuine action on climate change. They are just not serious, but this is serious. It has been too long. It has been a political game to this Prime Minister and his government for far too long. This is not a political game. Under this government, this country has wasted so much time and we are now out of time to waste. Australia should be a renewable energy powerhouse. And of course, wind, including offshore wind, should be a big part of that. Just like solar, we should be a wind superpower. We do have one of the longest coastlines in the world. We have some of the best wind resources in the world. Anyone who's uh, visited any of the coastlines down in Victoria, where I'm from, uh, would know that we do have some very windy coastlines in our state. And across the country, we have more offshore wind resource than we could actually use to, to supply our domestic market. 
recent re research by Blue Economy, indicates feasible wind resources of 2,223 gigawatts of capacity off Australia's coast. And in fact, our entire national energy market is around 55 gigawatts. So there's room for this offshore wind energy capacity, not just to help Australia, not just to help us with our energy needs, uh, with our transition to renewable energy, but also to be an export for our country and for us to be able to help other countries as well as grow industries. Of course, because we're so late, the rest of the world has already moved on this. And in fact, it was uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson who said, in 10 years time, offshore wind energy will be powering every home in the country. So in the UK, they already have the world's largest offshore wind generation capacity. And in October 2020, the UK government announced a target of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity by 2030, up from its original 30 gigawatts by 2030 target. So the rest of the world is ahead of this government. Energy providers here in Australia are ahead of this government. They know the capacity that's there in our wind offshore wind. They've just been waiting for this government to catch up and bring some legislation that allows them to harness that. There are more than 10 projects that have been waiting on the government to bring on this legislation so that they can get on with the job. And these projects have massive capability. Again, in my home state of Victoria, Star of the South, which will be off Gippsland, uh, will produce enough energy to cover 20% of our state's current energy needs. That is huge. A single turn of an offshore wind turbine can provide as much energy as a whole day's worth of rooftop solar. And some of the best wind resources are located just off, off the coast of the regions that have powered our country and that have built the industry that's powered our country for generations now. So Gippsland in my home state, Newcastle, which the member for uh, Newcastle has just spoken about, the Hunter Valley, the Illawarra, Illawarra, Gladstone and central Queensland. And these regions have all the things that support this offshore wind generation. They have the strong electricity grid infrastructure. They have the ports, the railways, and they have the populations for new energy and new industry. Uh, and it is striking that the proposals for offshore wind that we're seeing come forward in this country, the proposal that is just ready there to be unlocked once this government gets its act into gear, uh, are in our traditional energy regions because of this strong connection they have to the electricity grid, because of the infrastructure they already have in place. So it's these communities and these workers that have the most to gain from a thriving offshore wind energy industry. They will create the energy that will benefit all of Australia, but they will create the jobs that will benefit the regions and all of Australia as well. You know, it's not just putting in place offshore wind infrastructure. It's the turbines that need maintenance. It's the network of ships and the ports that are required for that maintenance. And so from a government that likes to talk up technology, not taxes, it's really disappointing to think that we've had to wait so long for this legislation that allows us to unlock all of that potential. So Labor does support this legislation and its aims. Uh, it's, uh, the bill establishes a regulatory framework for electricity infrastructure in the Commonwealth offshore area. It allows the construction, installation, commissioning, operation, maintenance and decommissioning of offshore wind and other electricity infrastructure. It allows the Energy Minister to declare a certain area as suitable for offshore electricity infrastructure and it establishes licence schemes for offshore electricity activities. Uh, as I said, Labor supports these aims. We are concerned that they've been too slow in coming and again that they are not as comprehensive as they should be and that's why we do think uh, and that's why I support the amendments that have been moved by the member for McMahon and make it clear once again that we must move quickly on this. Industry is ready. The rest of the world is moving. It is time for Australia to catch up. This is long overdue like most of the government's climate efforts, let's not make offshore wind energy the other part of the puzzle that slips this country by because we've got a government that is focused on slogans, that's focused on a political game and not actually focused on what will create the jobs of the future, of what will make sure that our country transitions 
to uh, net zero 2050 with a credible actual plan to get us there. Deputy or Speaker, <laughs> it did sound like the end, but I've got a little bit more. Deputy Speaker, the IPC report makes it very clear that the window to act on climate change is closing. If we don't take significant action now, we miss that window and the consequences for all of us are dire. We will not limit warming to the level that we need for us all to have a future. That is a real consequence for all of us. And of course, there are immediate economic consequences as we get locked out of the jobs and industries of the future. The jobs and the industries of the future that we should have right now in this country, but we don't because we get slogans rather than plans and commitments. In my community, the number one issue people raise with me is the need for genuine action on climate change, and they are not going to be bought off with a slogan. They are very clear that this country needs to transition. It needs to transition with jobs, with industries of the future, and it needs to transition so that we keep warming within acceptable levels for us all to have a future. We still haven't seen the plan, the commitment from this Prime Minister and this government that allows my community and the rest of Australia to be assured that that's where we're heading. In contrast, of course, Labor is very clear that we are committed to net zero by 2050. No quibblers on our side, no one who accepts a party room decision but actually tells the media they don't back it. We have plans in place. We have uh, a new energy apprenticeship program to train 10,000 young people for the energy jobs of the future. We want to make electric vehicles cheaper by cutting import and fringe benefit taxes and develop Australia's first national electric vehicle strategy. We want to invest in community batteries. We want to fix and modernise the, uh, the electricity grid with $20 billion to rewire the country. We know that you don't just do this work with a pamphlet. You do this work with commitment, with thoroughness, with the policies that back it up. And we continually fail to get those policies, to get that commitment from those on the other side. We don't have more time for political posturing, for political games, for slogans. It is time for action. And I say to my community that I continue to hear your voices on this. I know you're not satisfied with what's come out of this government this week. I will keep fighting for our country to do more, to do what we have to do to tackle climate change and get us all the future we deserve.